watching live or later, I am so glad to be with you. Chris and I had such an amazing time. Thank you so much for allowing us to take the month of August away to rest and reflect and reassess and re-envision all the re-things that for the future. It was truly life transforming and we appreciate it. Today, as Mariah just said, we're starting a brand new series called Soul Care. Everybody say Soul Care. Now, a few weeks ago, during August, Pastor Jay talked about soul quake and how to deal with a soul quake. But, but maybe if we learn how to have good soul care, we can avoid a soul quake, right? If you can think about an earthquake, his, his soul quake was kind of equating to an earthquake in our, in our soul. You can think about an earthquake. Earthquake happens because of fault lines. There's a crack under the surface that you can't see. I was growing up, I was taught California's going to drop off into the Atlantic, uh, into the Pacific Ocean, not the Atlantic, the Pacific Ocean because of the, uh, is it the San Andreas Fault? I don't know. Is it some big fault line there that's going to knock California into the ocean? And if you're from Texas, you kind of prayed for that. But anyway, that's another thing altogether. Forgive me, my California friends. I don't still have that opinion. It was just my upbringing. Uh, so, if you could somehow magically heal the fault line, there would be no potential for an earthquake. So what if there are fault lines in our soul, in our mind, our will, and our emotions? What if there are things underneath the surface that, that God could heal? And if He healed them, then we wouldn't have a soul quake. This morning, look with me. I'm going to read our text and then I'm going to pray. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 says this. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. The title of my message today is, that's a big butt you got there. The title of my message is, that's a big butt you got there. The question is, what you going to do with your butt? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you supernaturally can flow from my lips through these cameras and into people's, not only their homes, but their hearts. That you can penetrate through these invisible airwaves and bring an anointing wherever people are watching and transform their lives forever. And one encounter with you, God, can change my life forever. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you were to keep reading that story, it's, it's, it's 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14. We may have the reference. There it is. Uh, you can write it down and look up the whole story on your own later. I'm not going to take the time to read it, but I want you to be, uh, uh, take the time this week to go back and be diligent if you can and read it because it's such an amazing story. But let me just give you the, the gist of it, really kind of what he's saying. So there's this guy, Naaman, and we read verse one. He was this great guy. He had all these accomplishments, but he had this one thing. He was a leper, and so he wanted the, the leprosy dealt with, but, but he never had a way to do it. And the Syrians, who he worked for and was a commander of the army of the king of Syria, had gone, these men had gone on these raids and they had abducted this young lady and brought her back to Syria and she becomes the servant to Naaman's wife. Are you with me? So Naaman had a wife who had a servant. And this servant girl felt bad for Naaman 
I wouldn't have felt bad for Naaman because I'm a slave, but she had a very good attitude, and she said to her, her uh, the, the master of the house, Naaman's uh, wife, she said, if he could only get to the prophet in Israel, then, then he could be healed. The, there's a prophet in Israel that could heal him. And so Naaman's wife tells Naaman, and Naaman goes to the king and thinks, the, if there's really a way to get healed in Israel, then the king can do it. So the king writes a letter and sends it from the king of Syria to the king of Israel, and he sends it with Naaman and a bunch of money. One theologian says the amount of money is 1.2 million. Also, 10 changes of clothes. So I guess that's a big deal. Uh, if you, so, I mean, if, if you're sending 1.2 mil, I think these clothes are gonna have you dripping. You know what I'm saying? And, and so, 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 so he, he goes and he comes to the king with his offering, with all this stuff, and the king tears his clothes. And he says, who do you think I am, God? I can't, I can't heal anybody. What's going on? Well, well the prophet Elisha hears that what all happened, and he said, send him to me. God will heal him, and they'll know there's a prophet in Israel. Yeah. So Naaman goes to, to uh, Elijah's house, and he's imagining what's going to happen. And I'm sure, just imagine, when Naaman traveled, he didn't travel alone. Naaman had an entourage, you know what I'm saying? And so he's bringing all this stuff, and he bangs on the door, and Elisha sends his servant to the door. Answers the door, and, and, and there's Naaman, and he tells what all happened, and, and the servant says, just go wash in the River Jordan, and the prophet says you'll be healed. Huh. Naaman is furious. He slams the door and walks away. Do you know who I am? And, and he says, in the text it says, and he said, in my mind, I thought that the prophet would come to the door and he would make a big spectacle of all of this. That he would, he would go all Pentecostal, charismatic, television evangelist. He would blow on me, wave his coat, wave his hand over my leprosy, and say, be healed in Jesus' name. It's before Jesus, but you know, anyway. And he said, he tells me to go wash in a river. Not even a good river. I mean, he says, you could have sent me to the Far Far or one of the other rivers in Damascus because those are clean rivers. He's sending me to a nasty river. It's muddy. It's gross. People put their poop in it. Right upstream. Ain't going to that river. And he's walking away mad. And one of his servants says, hey, hey, master, you're a great man. You are incredible. You, if he had asked you to do something hard, wouldn't you have done it? This is no big deal. Why not just go dip in the river? Why is that a hard thing? Why are you so mad? And the amazing thing is, Naaman listened and watch what happens at the end of our text in verse 14, it says, so he, Naaman, went down. Everybody say, went down. And he dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. What an amazing story. Go back with me to where we began. Verse one. Now Naaman commander of the army of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he's a leper. Look at Naaman's resume there. That's pretty good. First of all, he's a commander in the military. He's a chief military commander. He is over all of the army of Syria, and Syria was a powerhouse in the earth. He, so he's a man in authority. Everybody say in authority. 
He, he was also a great man in the sight of his master and honored by his master. So he was not only a man in authority, he was a man under authority. And he was honored by the king. I, I, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be a soldier or a command, and he wasn't just a soldier, if I'm going to be a commander, if I'm going to be a chief, if I'm going to run the army, I want the king to think I'm honorable. So he was, he was a great man. He was honorable. He was a winner. Everybody say winner. <laughs> God gave him victory in Syria. He was favored by God. Uh, is anybody liking this resume? I mean, come on, Cameron. If I, say, if I started listing all this, yeah. Yeah. Cameron is a five-star general. He is revered by everyone in the nation. He has won battles all over the world. Yeah. He is the greatest. Yeah. He's Woo. honored by everyone. Woo. That's a pretty good resume. Favored by God. A mighty man of war. And then it says, a mighty man of valor. Let me tell you something about that phrase. You know who that phrase has been used about? Guys like David, Jephthah. Let me, let me tell you some of the, the, the rest of it. Gideon, uh, Jeroboam. From what I can find, Naaman is the only Gentile in all of Scripture that, it's, that the Bible calls a mighty man of valor. The only one. How many of you think that's a good resume? That's a great resume. But he was a leper. He only had this one weakness. This whole resume is a mile long, but a leper. But he's a leper. It's not a big deal, is it? What does that mean to us anyway in 21st century America, or wherever you're watching from, in our world today, what, what does that mean? Some places it still means stuff, but in most of the Western world it doesn't. He had this one tiny little issue. Well, maybe it's not that tiny. Ancient leprosy was different than leprosy today. It began as small red spots on the skin. Before long, the spots would grow and multiply and get bigger and turn white and shiny and scaly in their appearance. Pretty soon, they spread over your whole body. Is this blessing you? Your hair begins to fall out, first from the head, then your eyebrows, then all of your hair. As things get worse, your fingernails and your toenails become loose and begin to rot and fall off one at a time. Then the joints of your fingers and toes begin to rot, so your fingers start falling off one at a time. It begins to eat your face to the point, I wish you could see the look on Kendall's face behind the camera while I'm telling this. She's getting so grossed out. But I'm gonna come over here and talk. I'm gonna preach to, to you and Kendall right now. So the fingers would fall off. Your face would begin to then erode and rot until your nose fell off. The palate of your mouth would fall through. You couldn't eat, and you would ultimately starve to death. It was a terrible, terrible, terrible way to die. How many of you know that's not a little butt, that's a big butt? Somebody say, that's a big butt. See, everybody has a butt. The question is, how are you going to deal with your butt? With Naaman, his authority couldn't remove it. His warrior skills didn't get rid of it. His money couldn't buy its removal. His favor with God and man didn't make it go away. Everybody has a butt. A few weeks ago, Aaron preached a masterpiece about the one with the issue of blood, and he said everybody has issues. Somebody say, we all got issues. See, the woman with the issue of blood, her issue was a physical one. Naaman's butt was a physical issue. But we all have issues. Some aren't physical. Marcus is the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. He's got everything going for him. The job, the house, the car, the yacht, all the things. The title, the respect, the accolades. But his anger issues are destroying his relationships with those closest to him 
especially his family, and he's about to lose the things most dear to him while he has all these possessions. Cindy was popular in school, in high school. She was a beautiful young lady, an excellent student athlete. She gets a full ride to college, and she excels immediately in her career. She's literally succeeded in everything she's ever done. And once she gets a career, she's promoted immediately and continuously. But she's a perfectionist. And the impossible standards that she imposes on herself and others make it impossible for her to keep and enjoy long-lasting and fulfilling relationships so her butt is destroying her life. Dwayne is a pastor, a preacher, a prophet. He's traveled the world. He's been to 63 different nations. He's preached face-to-face and trained over 100,000 pastors and leaders. He's written a book. He he's, he's, he's leads an amazing church and, and has done mission stuff all over the world. But Dwayne has a but. But Dwayne has insecurities and Dwayne has issues that have held him back and issues that have affected his life and those closest around him. It's caused dysfunction. I could go on and on, but you get the idea. Everyone has a butt. And like Naaman's leprosy, they may seem small or even be small at first. But after a while, if they're unchecked, they grow. And slowly they're eating away our lives. Peter, Peter Scazzaro, in his book, The Emotionally Healthy Leader, calls them shadows. Shadows. I have a shadow somewhere. There it is. I have a shadow there. I don't know if that camera can see my shadow. I had to look hard to find it, but you could see it easily. At least you can see the effects of it. All of us have shadows in our soul. We have issues that we need healing from. Mark 8, our theme text for this series, says it this way. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world but lose his own soul? I don't know about you, but growing up in church, I always heard that preach says, what if you gain the whole world and don't make it to heaven? And we thought our soul was actually our spirit. But our soul is not our spirit. Our spirit is something different. So you can, you can gain the whole world and, 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 and your spirit go to heaven, but you can lose your soul on the earth. Let, let, I need three volunteers to help me out. Three, three folks, just come stand right here. Three people, come on, anybody, I don't care, three. One, two, three, okay, there you go. Stand right here. Uh, one in front of the other, one in front of the other. There you go, all right. So, God made us a triune being. We we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. The issue is, God called us, I'm I'm gonna flip that, we are a spirit, you're still a soul, and we live in a body, all right? God designed our spirit to lead. My spirit man is what gets born again. My spirit man is righteous already in Christ Jesus. My spirit man, come on, are you here? My spirit man is seated in heavenly places. My spirit man only has kingdom desires. My spirit man, Numa man, it's P-N-E-U-M-A, Numa. Numa man can. Numa man can do it all. But here's the problem. Most of us take Numa man put them back here and take one of these guys and put them up here. Now, if my, my natural desires lead, I'm pretty primal. <laughs> I, I've, I've kind of I've lowered myself to nothing much more than just fleshly desires, like animal kind of desires. So most of us, this guy's not leading. Now, he'll jump out front when I'm really hungry and hungry turns to hangry, so then I'm gonna let him leave, but I feed him, he go get back in line, right? 
But, but who we're usually letting lead is soul man. <laughs> so, so, so this is your spirit is your pneuma, your soul is your psyche in Greek, and your flesh is your soma, all with the P in front of them. So when soul man leads, <laughs> I, I, I got a problem because he is then controlling spirit man. And I'm using man in the gender non-specific sense. Come on, humanity, right? So when he is broken, when he has, has damage in parts of his makeup, then although my spirit man is thriving, my, my humanity is weak because my soul or my flesh are leading. So part of what we have to do with soul care is put soul man back where he belongs and put spirit man back in charge. Because spirit man wants to do the will of God. Spirit man, it, come on, is obedient all the time. Spirit man. All right, give them a big hand. They did a great job. So what profits a man if he gains the whole world and his soul is broken? Loses his wholeness. So here are a few things today to kick off our series we can learn from Naaman that will help us <clears throat> have some soul care. It will help us deal with our butt. <laughs> It'll help us eliminate our big butt. <laughs> Number one, we gotta recognize we can't do it alone. Turn to your neighbor and say, I can't do it alone. Come on, if you're by your house, or by yourself in your house, just tell yourself, hey self, you can't do it alone. If Naaman could have gotten rid of his own problem on his own, he would have done it already. He had the position, he had the power, he had the influence, he had the money. He had to listen to those around him, even though all the people he had to listen to were under his authority. Dad, that's like your kid telling you what you need to do to get better. You don't like that. And Aaron's a teacher. It's like your students correcting you. He'll say, let me tell you something with a smile. Because he always smiles. Yes. But when he smiles, he's like, Pastor, he might be about to tell you difficult things. Right. I'm sure Naaman wanted to say, I'm going to slap all y'all. Right into next week. So first of all, it's a young girl. His wife's servant. Put that into context of his situation. Then secondly, his own servants who challenged him. Why, why won't you listen and do this easy thing? It's hard enough for him to listen to this girl, but now he's angry. He's humiliated. And he's got to listen to his own servants. They said, you've come all this way. Why can't you just do it? How many of you know it would have been so easy for Naaman to say, you're fired. I'm still out of here. And he would have kept his leprosy. You can, you can do it on your own and keep your dysfunction if you want it, but how's that working for you? Number two. Number two, number two. Number one. We can't do it on our own. Number two, we can't dictate our own healing. <laughs> Let that sink in for a minute. He didn't, he didn't like the source of his healing, the servant girl and his servants, and, and, and he didn't like the terms, go dip in a muddy river. You may not choose the source, but you can choose whether you receive it or not. Let me say that again. You don't get to choose the source, but you do get to choose if you receive it or not. It's your choice. A band of warriors, like I said, had raided this village, took this girl, and, and she was named and servant. And she said, if only my Lord, the master, your husband, could see the prophet in Samaria, he could be healed. Why listen to this little girl? What does she know? She could be tricking me. 
She could be trying to humiliate me. She could be trying to get me killed. Many times, God will choose the people we wouldn't choose to bring about our healing. So many times it's that person you didn't expect, that person you didn't want to say that thing, but you know somewhere you're hearing that it's God's voice within the voice. One of the things we did on our, intensive, on our sabbatical is Chris and I went to a week-long intensive. We went to counseling, we, we, we drove or flew all the way to Ohio, and we went to this intensive, and, and on the way there, I actually had a dear friend of mine whom I love and he cares about me. He said, now, now, Dwayne, you need to make sure that this person has this kind of education and they understand this and they know the complexities of your life and they know all the things that you've done and where you've been. And, and, I, I, and I just looked at him and I said, thank you. Thank you so much for that advice. I'm not taking any of it. Why? Because God was doing something in Dwayne where Dwayne wasn't gonna dictate his own healing. Dwayne wasn't going to try to tell the person God put in front of Dwayne to help Dwayne to then tell him how Dwayne needs help because that is dysfunction gone to seed and blooming great big flowers. So what did, what did I have to do? I went, I said, I don't care if the guy's got a third grade education, if he can't even spell dysfunction, I don't care if he's the worst counselor in the world, God is gonna speak through him to me and I'm gonna get my soul sorted out so that I can go to the next place God has for me rather than stay here where I'm at. I'm telling somebody, you gotta come to a place where you say, I am not gonna dictate my own healing. It's arrogance. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Come on. I'm not mad. <laughs> I'm just passionate. So we're like Naaman. We might not like the source God chooses, but we also might not like the terms. Naaman was looking for a cure and God was trying to give him a process. He was, he was looking for relief, and God was giving him a journey. <laughs> he, he sought help from the person he thought could help him. So, so actually, it's interesting. Naaman didn't try to do it himself. He had, but he couldn't anymore. So when he heard this news, he didn't run to Israel. He got the most important person he knew to go to the king of Israel, and that's his king. So he went to the logical person to help him. You know, sometimes it might not be the person you thought. And it also might not be the way you thought. Because see, the way the king thought was not the way God wanted. The king thought, send a mill. Send a cool million and get the king dripping with some new clothes. And it's all good. He'll fix you right up. I love you, Naaman. Come on, go. I got the answer, baby. And he gets there and the king rips his clothes and says, what do you think? I can't do this. God had another way. And, and here's what's interesting. Naaman wasn't really impressed with God's person or his process. <laughs> Naaman didn't like the person God chose. He didn't like the process God chose. You may not like the person. You also may not like the process. But that's not up to you. He comes to Elisha's door, like I said, with the chariots and the horses, and he sends a messenger. And the messenger says, go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And in verse 11, it says, he said, I thought he would come out to me. So I have this issue that I wanted healed, and I've gone through all this process, and now I thought it would happen this way, and and and. And you got to think about protocol because Naaman would have been humiliated that a servant came to speak to him. It would have been so easy to say, hey, you know who I am? I'm Naaman. I have God's favor. I have the king's favor. I got the people's favor. I could have you killed. Do you realize you opened that door? I don't like what you said. I have you killed. And your silly prophet. He'd be a non-prophet. He'd be a dead prophet. And he says, I thought he'd put his hands on me. I thought he'd call on the name of the Lord. I thought he'd wave over the spot, maybe speak in tongues, do something really grand. 
and then cure me. But here's the thing. He couldn't dictate where his healing came from, the person, and he couldn't dictate what his healing looked like, the process. He had to quit controlling the situation. He wanted to pick the person of healing. He wanted to pick the place of his healing. He said, aren't the Abana and the far, far better? Here's the bottom line. God's healing never comes on my terms. Number three. This leads us number three. We have to humble ourselves and get over our pride. Verse 14 says, so he went down. He went down. He went down. That means the river wasn't very deep. If I was naming, I'd have been thinking, couldn't you have got me a deep river where I could just kind of jump in, do a cannonball, get out, be healed? I kind of imagine it is maybe only about this tall. So he gets out there, and it's like here. And he's going, you got to be kidding me. Now I got to humiliate myself? No, no, no. It's not humiliation. It's humility. God's never going to humiliate you, but he will humble you. God gives, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. See, if you're taking notes, you ought to write this down. Humility is the highway to health and wholeness. Humility is the highway to health and wholeness. And then number four, and I'm done. The fourth lesson we can learn to get rid of our buddies, we gotta stay the course. Think about how easy it would have been to give up. He gets there and he goes, okay. One. Nothing. Two. Still there. Three. It's not any better. Four. Why am I doing this? It doesn't work. It's not helping. God, what are you doing to me? Well, why isn't it helping? I think I'm going to quit. I went to counseling. It didn't help. I went to church. I, I prayed. I, I did everything they told me to do. Six. God, I'm tired. I'm humiliated. I used to have some dignity. What if this doesn't work? What if the little girl tricked me all along? This is so cruel. Still nothing. God, I'm going to go in one more time. You said seven, so even though I see no evidence, I'm going to go one more time. I'm not sure when I get up it's going to have done any good. But maybe one spot will be removed. Maybe I'll have some kind of hope. But you said seven, so I went seven with the last bit of strength I have, here I go. And he gets up, and he looks, and it's gone. The leprosy's gone. The infection is gone. His nails are restored. His hair comes back. His skin is like a baby, and his butt is removed. What if he had quit after three? What if he had quit after four or five? I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to give up. 
in my lifetime. But today we can hang on to Psalms 23, 3. He restores my soul. And I just believe that I'm talking to somebody right now that you have tried, but you feel like it didn't work. As a matter of fact, you went down and things seemed to get worse. You came up and it looked like it had multiplied. But I'm telling you, if you'll stay humble, if you'll go low, grace is coming. If you'll keep doing what God is asking you to do, you're gonna come up when, when God has completed His work. That healing and that wholeness is yours. It's yours. I wanna ask you today, I'm done. Will you let Will you let God take you on a path to soul restoration? He restores my soul. I'm asking each of us to begin a journey over these next few weeks, a journey to letting God deal with our issue, our but. So I want to ask you, will you go with me? If you will. Would you stand, even in your home? These guys are standing because they're going on the journey. They're going, look, they're all going with us. We're, can we go together as a family? Can we let God take us to a place of healing and wholeness? Now that you're standing, some of you, even in your home, may as a sign of humility want to just bow your knee. You may just want to humble yourself. Say, I stand saying I'm going on the journey, but I, I kneel and surrender to you, God. Let me pray for you. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to go into every home and every heart, every car that's driving, every living room, every office, every kitchen, every bedroom. And God, I pray that by your grace, you would help us go on this journey. That every person, no matter how good or how bad all other things may seem, that they would humble themselves and say, God, I surrender. I'm yours. Father, I thank you that healing is working. Healing that you are restoring our soul in Jesus' name. If you agree, why don't you give the Lord a hand clap right there where you are. Come on, somebody thank God right now. He's restoring my soul. Listen, we're going to send you back to your host. They're going to give you a little bit of instruction before you go today, but I just want to say, as I always do, it's been a month since I've told you, Chris and I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. Have a great week.